In Russia, the decade of the 1860s was an extraordinarily creative time for literary prose. The most outstanding prose artists of that time were clearly Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Turgenev. And of course, it might be surprising for people now to realize that in those days, Turgenev had the, perhaps the strongest reputation. Uh, Turgenev was considered to be the outstanding member of that team. Today, of course, the opinions have shifted radically, and sometimes Turgenev has given rather short shrift indeed, I think somewhat unjustly. Uh, it seems to me his novels were uh, quite powerful in their own way, even though they didn't have the obvious passion and power and strength of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. In no small way, they were all caught up in the themes of the polemics between generations and among the political and ideological groups which had their own various programs for the future of their very rapidly changing country. The relatively open and liberal regime of Tsar Alexander II made it possible to debate many of these issues openly, and the Russian writers jumped into the fray with blazing polemical pens. One of the great themes that he dealt with, and of course it became the title of his most famous novel, was the theme of the change of generations, of the relationship between fathers and sons. This novel, of course, had an extraordinary influence on the people around him, most especially, by the way, on Dostoevsky. And of course, this whole business of fathers and sons, of how one generation gives way to another, how a second generation in some ways takes, takes what it can from the previous generation, but on the other hand, tends to revolt against that generation, is something that's been caught in many, many different kinds of literature. It really goes back to the Bible. It goes back to the 22nd chapter of Genesis, where, uh, as you may remember, uh, Abraham goes out to uh, sacrifice Isaac, his son. Now, I realize that uh, uh, children can sometimes be annoying, particularly on a rainy day when they're in the house till 5 o'clock in the afternoon. But while it, it's okay to be angry at them, it's not really uh, considered very good form to go out and kill them. And yet, uh, Abraham claims that he heard from God that he should take his only son and go out and kill him. As you know, uh, it, it got uh, uh, very dangerous and very, uh, very, uh, very threatening until finally, at the very last moment, Isaac was saved from being killed. And uh, remember the, the appearance of the ram. And you might think that the title of the story, if, if we had to give it a title, we might say something like, well, the almost sacrifice of Isaac. As a matter of fact, the classical title of that story tells us something very relevant to what we're talking about now. The title of that story is Akedah, which in Hebrew means binding. Now, of course, binding obviously applies uh, to the fact that if you're going to take a 32-year-old son, Isaac was 32 at the time, and sacrifice him, you've got to bind him somehow. He's, he's, uh, even if he doesn't want to, he's going to resist when the, the knife is coming down on him. So, of course, it, it talks about the binding of hands or the binding of feet, perhaps. But binding, it's also binding in another sense. It's the binding between generations. How does binding take place between generations? One would think that if you're talking about binding, it would be one generation taking things from the other and connecting itself with the other. But as a matter of fact, uh, as the story very well implies, the relationship that leads to binding also involves hostility, also involves danger. As a matter of fact, it also, almost all in the, in the story, it almost involved killing. Well, how is it that the relationship between generations involves both taking from the generation and rebelling against the generation. And that rebelling and taking, of course, is something that's very close to the problem of fathers and sons. Turgenev uh, managed to straddle many of these most hotly debated issues of his day, thereby calling down upon his head intense fire from all sides of the political spectrum. Uh, as you might say, uh, uh, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown of a liberal. The novel itself takes place in the countryside on the estate of the Kirsanov family. We first observe the place through the eyes of Nikolai Kirsanov, who is excitedly awaiting the arrival of his son, Arkady, who's just come back from student life at a large Russian university. In the father's strong emotions, we experience not only the delight of family reunion, but also a certain trepidation. Uh, for, some, for a very uh, strong reason. After the death of his wife, Nikolai has entered into close relations with a young woman from the lower class, and the two of them already have a young child, a new and unexpected brother for Arkadji. And the old man, of course, doesn't know how Arkadji is going to react to this. And, of course, the presence of the unexpected brother brings us back 
to Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov. Dostoevsky also talks about the bringing up of a younger generation when he has Alyosha in the brothers Karamazov take charge of a group of young people who are very, very bright, uh, sometimes very, very nasty, and sometimes very, very rebellious. And of course, in Dostoevsky, trying to work out the relationships between Alyosha and these children, uh, which presumably will be better than the relationship between the brothers Karamazov and their father, you have Dostoevsky dealing with the theme of fathers and sons, a theme which he quite consciously took from Turgenev. Now, of course, the situation in the, in the Kirsanov house, in Turgenev's novel, is made even more complicated by the fact that Arkady has brought uh, a guest to the house, a young man by a uh, name that, of course, has become very famous in literature, Bazarov. And clearly, Bazarov is very much a model for many of the characters that Dostoevsky had put in his novels. One of Turgenev's most famous characters, the young guest, represents the new radical thinking of a younger Russian generation just coming out of the universities. It doesn't take Bazarov very long to let the older generation know, in a deliberately offensive tone, that he holds all of their most cherished convictions in deep contempt. He proudly adopts the title, uh, a word that wasn't too well known before Turgenev wrote this novel. It, it's, it's even possible that Turgenev originated. He calls himself nihilist in Russian, that is to say, a nihilist. Nihil, of course, in Latin means nothing. A word rather new to the ears of Nikolai and his aristocratic brother, Pavel. It's Nikolai Kirsanov and Pavel Kirsanov. These nihilists believe that nothing is worth preserving from the older generation. They want to deal with the world in a way that later on was described by the revolutionaries as a tabula rasa. That is to say, a table which has been scraped entirely clean. Nothing, absolutely nothing, that comes from the previous generation is of any use to them. Pavel gets very angry about this. He said, but look, you, uh, I, I consider myself a liberal, he says, but nevertheless, I realize that there are some things that we have to preserve. He, he, he talks about the English aristocracy who have the slogan of noblesse oblige. They know their rights, but in turn, they respect the rights of other people. And uh, Pavel sees the English aristocracy as worthy of, uh, of, uh, of imitation. He and Bazarov get into a passionate and heated argument about the perceived worth, or rather, from Bazarov's point of view, the complete absence of worth and the most cherished convictions of the older generation. Pavel is so upset, he says, but you're rejecting the Russian people. Bazarov says to him with great cynicism, he said, you talk about the Russian people, you aristocrats who sit in your estate and enjoy your tea and your good food and your easy life. He said, if it comes between you and me, who is closer to the Russian peasant? Uh, I'll bet that you can't even talk to the Russian peasant. The Russian peasant immediately recognizes me as someone who's very close to him. I speak his language. I know what he does. Don't talk to me about the Russian peasant. Pavel Petrovich tries to talk about law, and, and Bazar says, yes, the law that allows the landlord to whip the uh, serf whenever he feels like it. Well, what about family relationships? He said, well, I suppose you've never, Bazarov replies, well, I suppose you've never heard of the right of the first night where the landowner thinks he has the right to sleep with the bride of the peasant. As you might imagine, this is very, very irritating to Pavel Petrovich. Now, Nikolai, and even more strongly his brother Pavel, are proud of their liberal notions and proposals for reform in Russian society. It's, after all, very close. Uh, within a year or two will occur the emancipation for all of Russians, Russia's millions of serfs. Pavel defends the notion of aristocratic noblesse oblige, as well as a defined stable society where cultured and beneficent aristocrats tend to the needs of the less fortunate countrymen. Bazarov, of course, has unconcealed contempt for aristocratic condescension and non-comprehension. He brushes aside their notions of social philanthropy, boldly boasting that he knows the country much better than any of them could possibly know, and there's nothing worth preserving in the country as it now stands. All has to be destroyed and turned into nihil or nothing. Only then can a better reality be conceived. In order to do this, even Russian poetry must be destroyed. Only materialist science, only uh, the dissection of frogs, only medicine can offer ideas and concepts of value to Russian society. Bazarov, of course, has been trained as a doctor uh, following in the footsteps of his father. As a matter of fact, later on, when Arkadzi sees his father reading Pushkin, the son gently takes the book out of the older man's hands and replaces it with a famous contemporary German materialist tract. The very title tells you something about it, Stoff und Kraft. 
material and strength. This gesture only emphasizes the young people's utter disdain for poets and imaginative literature, whose worth they put so far below the work of scientists that Bozarov says, one decent scientist is worth nine poets. In a way, this reminds us of Turgenev's own statement, which so infuriated Dostoevsky. You remember that he said, uh, I mentioned this before, that if the Crystal Palace were destroyed, containing all the useful inventions known to mankind, Russia would, would lose absolutely nothing because Russia has never made such contributions. And of course, this reflected the approach of the radicals we're talking about. Well, of course, the, the, the argument breaks up. Each side goes off, uh, Pavel, in, in short, to lick his wounds, and uh, Bazarov, as he rather sarcastically says, uh, I'm going off to dissect frogs. In the novel, of course, we see the expression of the extreme conclusions drawn by the nihilists. And Bazarov seems to be one of the strongest male characters drawn by Turgenev. In the beginning of the novel, you see a tremendous psychological and even physical strength in Bazarov. As a kind of a contrast to the atmosphere of Bazarov's polemics against the older generation, uh, Turgenev gives us a picture of Russian feminine society in the countryside of the 1860s. He does this by a contrast between a caricature of what the Russians would have called a liberated woman and a female character who, now we're, we're thinking that Bazarov is very strong, yet this female character turns out to be the strongest figure in the novel. And of course it, it fits very well the pattern of all of Turgenev's novels. Uh, when the two young men leave the Kirsanov estate, they go to visit a woman named Yevdoksia Kukshina. Now, this is a rather nasty <laughs> phrase on the Turgenev's part. Kukshina is very close to a very pornographic Russian phrase. And of course, the very name is making a very nasty uh, fun, uh, fun of this woman and uh, denigrating her to a very low level. She's described as a truly emancipated progressive woman. She turns out to be the kind of person who scatters pronouncements in the air it scatters questions in the air without the slightest intent of intelligent communication. She dismisses the notions of all serious contemporary thinkers. As a matter of fact, she even has contemptuous words for Georges Sand, the famous woman novelist at that time, who was so widely admired by reformers in Russia. And of course, all of this is put forward in the name of what she calls materialism and progress. And no matter what anybody says, uh, she will put it down. Uh, Bazarov, although you would think that after all what she says fits very nicely, with his views, he has sense enough to take her very lightly in spite of her, her seemingly materialist views which seem to agree with what, what he th says, but he doesn't hesitate rather cynically to take advantage of her hospitality, uh, particularly uh, her good champagne. Uh, you're, you're beginning to see that there's another element of Bazarov that's not quite so crystal clean, or we might say squeaky clean, as Bazarov tries to present himself in the house of the Kursanovs. Uh, he's quite willing to use other people. He's quite, quite willing to enjoy the champagne of a woman whom he holds in utter contempt. He's quite willing to let her go on about opinions that ostensibly agree with his while secretly considering her nothing to be a total idiot. Furthermore, in the beginning of the novel, you think that the relationship between Arkadji, the young man who's come from the university in Bazarov, is a close one. And uh, Arkadji considers himself a close friend of Bazarov. He even almost considers himself a pupil of Bazarov. But as the novel goes on, you begin to realize that Bazarov is, is lording it over Arkadji, that as a matter of fact, at a certain point, he's even willing to uh, engage in, in the physical struggle with Arkadji in which he could overcome him like he could overcome a puppy. There's, there's a would-be tyrant in this Bazarov uh, that is by no means attractive. Although, of course, when he's arguing with Pavel, Pavel Petrovich, obviously Turgenev wants us to kind of enjoy the fact that he can trump the, the old man whenever he wants to. Uh, 